Hi, my name's Jason Call. We're with Small House Solutions. I'm Shay Reynolds. And you guys are based out of Austin, Texas. How's the uh, Austin, Texas market for small homes and tiny homes? That's amazing. Just like it is everywhere. People have the idea that they want to go tiny or they want to look into going tiny or seriously considering it. And they just don't know exactly where to go. Google gives a few answers. And the name of our company was based around the fact that we just want to provide the solutions to people to be able to do it. And we love that lifestyle. How many people are getting a hold of you with questions or inquiries? How many times have you shown this particular model? We've had this model for uh, since 2014. And we started off just showing it on the weekends. Uh, but we probably, uh, fast forward to date now, we might show it uh, on an average of six to eight times a day. Really? Um, yeah, from um, either couples, students, retirees, pretty much all across the board of people wanting to check out this type of lifestyle. So you're seeing the whole demographic, young, older, middle-aged? Yeah, we're seeing them. Um, uh, it's hard to really pinpoint you know, what demographic or, or at what phase of life someone would be interested. It seems really across the board just because the land values have gone up in the cities. It's pushing everyone out, and this gives you a chance to you know, live a little more of your life and not put so much into where, you know, where you're living. Do you think that's the main reason why people are interested in this, or do you think it's people wanting to pare down like they're wanting less stuff, or do you think it's more the financial reasons, like you mentioned, the cities? Or is it a combination? Well, it's a combination. We, we probably more of the financial first uh, because that applies to more people. But uh, there's definitely the paring down as well. And it's not necessarily just a, a retired teacher that's wanting to downsize and pare down. It, it can also be uh, a young family that has uh, lived somewhere for a few years and realized they have rooms that aren't being used and that they don't need all that space. There's also investment-minded people that are looking to purchase something at a good price that they can get a good return on. That uh, A lady has bed and breakfast and wants another unit in the back. Maybe a couple of private units has a bit of land. So it's a variety of people. Like throwing them in the backyard. They have this space where they can put another you know, source of income coming in. Right. Are you seeing any particular... Uh, I guess it's any particular... Say with the younger demographic, are you seeing any reason why they're doing it? The older demographic, any particular reason they're doing it? Or like you mentioned earlier, is it just it starts out as financial and then there's other caveats? Or are yeah. you seeing any trends? The, the younger demographic uh, starting to realize uh, because the apartment rates are going up. And they're, not going, they're going up almost every time they renew. They start to realize, uh, well, I've paid four years in an apartment, $1,200 a month. And they're just doing some simple math and realizing, wow, I could have paid this off in six years and owned at least the house. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I think the, uh, the, the older retiree or um, you know, you know, the, the more established uh, person is just realizing they didn't quite need that 2,000 square foot house. Uh, that their kids have maybe moved on, you know, moved to another city, and they just have a lot of space and a lot of stuff. So uh, they're also finding it very attractive. This smaller, smaller, uh, less obligation uh, to your house, and uh, just more time to live. So when it comes down to the technology, how people are able to listen to this podcast or watch this video, and they're seeing these conversations. Do you think the technology has encouraged more tiny home living, or do you think that it's always been, you know, part of the society we just didn't know about. Do you think this is growing or do you think it's just becoming more, more spread out? People are starting to become more aware of this living. People are becoming more aware of it, definitely become of technology. I think it's something like maybe it was buried deep in the heart of man to go back to our innate core needs of just surviving and having fun with family, free time to be flexible. And now, through media, we've been able to have a slice of that idea, something housing, which is extremely important, that is bringing that out of us. So, for me, I don't want to speak as a collective, but for me, it's, it's that ability to downsize, live simpler, and focus more on what's important and help people along the way. So when you say focus on what's important, what, what, what do you mean by that? Like, what, what do you think people are finding that's more important in living simply? Like... Can you elaborate on that? Family, uh, seeing God's creation, 
uh, spending time with your friends, learning, reading. Not just this nine to five, man, where we work to live, we work to eat, uh, we work, 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 and we we don't have more time to spend upon things that each individual may find important to them deep in their core of human need. We were talking about a podcast briefly before, and uh, another one I've been listening to is Tim Ferriss show, and he had a guy on there called uh, Mr. Money Mas- Mustache, and he was a software engineer. He retired at 30, and now him, his wife, and his son, they live on less than $30,000 a year, and they're basically living off of their investments now. And, you know, Tim Ferriss asked him, so what would you do with your days? Like, anything that brings me excited, anything that I'm passionate about. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and I think that's uh, that's something that this affords people, you know, that, that may not have been born into money or had a successful business that just made it so they could just live off whatever, like people that have to work for a living, they can actually have something like this, but still go back and enjoy their, their, their lives. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Definitely been seeing that. So out of the people, you get so many people coming in, what are some of the big misconceptions? Like people, they, they think they want to do a tiny home and then they see one. What's, what's a lot of the, uh, you know, they, they look at it and they're like, well, What's, what's going on here? Well, we have a large audience that will come in that have seen that, you know, numerous TV shows, and it's a bit glamorized on, you know, how you actually get into a small house or tiny house. I mean, there are, in most cities, uh, you're, you're going to have some permit uh, requirements that you have to meet, and you have, um, you know, land placement for what, whatever dwelling you're going to have. So there's a few things you have to check into before just throwing yourself into the lifestyle and saying, I want to spend fifty or sixty thousand. I want to buy that house, but um, that's where our passion comes in. We we realize there was a there's a lot of builders out there. There's a lot of hype for this industry, but there's a whole process to to actually um, change your lifestyle and and you know live in a smaller house. So uh, when people come in and meet with us, we're able to uh, explain that process, work through the permit. Um, you know, situation or, you know, find land, hook them up with realtors in some situations so they can make their dream come true. Um, that's really where our placement is and where our passion is, is to enable um, these people, um, anyone interested in changing their life, to, to take a hold of their life and start to uh, enjoy their free time a little bit more. It's not so much a, a misconception that a lot of people end up having, in my experience, more of an acknowledgement of their own ignorance. And them calling us or coming in saying, help us. You know, We don't know zoning here. Oh, I'm in the ETJ here. I can go ahead and do this without having a city permit. You know, All these details that go into how do you acquire a property? Will a realtor even really know what to get you? Do they have access in the MLS to put no deed restrictions? So there's a lot of things that really, if you want to live tiny, um, that you you either need to train yourself with and do a lot of research or uh, let somebody who already has done it help you out with it along the way. Absolutely. So you said ETJ? Yeah, the extraterritorial jurisdiction. Can can you explain that and what the problem, like, not that there's a problem, but can you explain what that is and how that affects people looking for tiny homes here in this area? Right, yeah. So every year the city of Austin is able to annex 20,000 acres. And what that means is they're able to take an area that wasn't city of Austin and make it city of Austin, spread their wings. So they have a list of areas they want to, and they're thinking about it over the years. That's called the extraterritorial jurisdiction. So that's... Uh, County county ordinances as far as land development and zoning is con- there is no zoning. Mm-hmm. You do have deed restrictions in your subdivisions. So Steiner Ranch on West Austin Hills, you're not going to have uh, a bunch of tiny houses lined up because they have certain requirements. So we just help help people with that because they want to live tiny, they want to do it, and uh, we like helping that as well as just selling the beautiful product. Is the land the biggest hang-up people are finding themselves in? Like actually finding a spot? The land is the biggest, uh, the biggest issue or, or thing we have to look into first before we can set up a manufacturer and start designing the house. Um, you know, we, we have several manufacturers that build great products, but you know, in that eight-week build time, we have to know where, that, where it's going to be able to go and how we can hook it up so we can properly satisfy that customer into a living situation. 
So with, with these tiny homes or small homes, if, uh, if someone were to go into a normal backyard and they, they had the, the permission they had, possibly the utility possibility to hook up the water mm -hmm. and electric, what, what, what's that process like? Like if somebody has something like that, like what, what's the first thing you work with them with? So, so already in Austin here, they've approved what's called the ADU, accessory dwelling unit. And that's a, that's a small house or a tiny house that you can put into the existing infrastructure where there's already a house on, on the property. They just require the lot to be 5,500 square feet or larger, and then uh, there's some placement, you know, concerns. You have to, you know, place it out of flood zones and things like that. But once you do that, and that's what we've done here, is um, you get all your certifications, your building and electrical and plumbing, and then you can go ahead and live in that, or you can have it as a vacation home. Employees can live in that on the, on the property. So there's a lot of different things, and even you can rent it out for a profit. So there's a lot of things you can do under the ADU, which is now legal to do. Um, but that does require that either someone owns the land or you need to partner with someone that owns the, the existing house. So it's, it's still some work to, to, to have that land be qualified for, for your permanent living if you're looking to do that. So the, the getting water to the house and electric, I feel like that's the easy part. So what about the septic? How does that work? Like well, say, say you go up to a backyard, how do you hook up a septic system? That's yeah. a nice thing. In the city, they all hook up to the sewer. So you can't run any septic in, in the city. You're going to hook them to the sewer, you can flush the toilet whenever you want, run your water, you don't ever have to worry about draining it out. Gotcha. It's when you're outside uh, the city is when you're going to look at a septic design and there's some other alternative uh, ways to dispose of your waste. And you mentioned earlier there's a big difference between a tiny home and a small house. Can you elaborate on that and how how you two see that differently? Yeah, tiny house that you can pull on the back of a 250. Um, we've heard from people very involved with the tinier models that it can be really difficult if you're talking about going uh, living a nomadic lifestyle sometimes and difficult on the truck with the transmission. So we would say that a lot of the things you see on the TV shows that are 200 square foot that you got to pull. Um, may not be the best fit for everyone. So a smaller house, something more that you're gonna park, and if you have a desire to maybe move every few years, this is doable for that. It can cost $2,000, $2,400 to have it moved and then uh, secured back to the earth and blocked and leveled again. Uh, but this is like a hybrid between a, a house, like a, a big house, a mobile home, single wide, and a tiny house. And so a lot of people are looking for that niche right there in between. Oh, absolutely. So what what type of truck would it take to to move this? Like, is there is that like the hybrid of like the F three fifty to the semi? Is that one of, like one of those sport trucks? So the three ninety nine uh, ones that are considered park models, and those are livable. Uh, we would say full size appliances, something where you have a room, you don't have to climb up in the loft to sleep. Those do take an eighteen wheeler to to move. So it's not something that we recommend any clients do themselves, and we contract with a company that does it as well. And then we have our team come in and block and level and tie it down to the ground. That way it's a, it's a really solid structure, can handle the winds, and you, know, you want something that's going to uh, be a permanent uh, situation for you, even though... Uh, if you decide a year or two years you want to move across town, we can unstrap it and move it across town so you don't have to leave your house behind. We're establishing a relationship with a uh, developer in uh, South Austin, and we expect that uh, we will have spaces uh, available for small house and tiny house um, enthusiasts later this year. So uh, it's something we're, we'll be the first in the country and being that Austin is uh, you know, probably one of the best places to live around the country, we're fortunate to have a, uh, a city that's been you know, named the, the best uh, place to live. We're very excited about you know, what that's going to bring, the people it's going to bring in our new community. So what's it like living in one of these during the summer? Like, is, does one unit keep this thing cool, like with, with how big it is? A unit like this, you'd probably want to go with the dual zone mini split, one in the bedroom, 
one on the wall mount here. Um, so that's that would be ideal, is what our HVAC contractors have told us is what's going to be needful uh, in Texas summer. I heard uh, it's pretty pretty warm down here during the, the summer. I don't know if I'd want to stick around too long for the summer here. We typically try and stick around the 60, 75 degree range. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. that's nice. Anything with clients, anything with perceptions that may be off, like the perceptions people have of tiny homes. Yeah, maybe a, the financing issue, you know, finding financing has been an issue, and it's becoming a, a easier now. Just the options with RV loan or somebody that has a, an ADU desire, maybe a, you can get a refinancing on the mortgage or a construction loan, um, financing land through various various entities, uh, farm credit. You know, they, they actually work with smaller parcels as well, the ranch really? lenders. They work with, you know, things outside the city, and they know how to find them or put you in connection with the realtors that do. If you're looking to go that route of pur- purchasing at least a, an acre or two. Um, so that's good. Um, and what about- it's, uh, just excited about the developments that you're seeing as the industry kind of starts to become positive towards this idea, and they know it's not going to go away. So be beforehand, like, say, 2014... It, there wasn't a positive perspective of, of tiny homes? No, no. There was a, um, you know, the the general thought was it was just going to, you know, congest the neighborhoods. It was going to, you know, kind of bring down the value of, of neighborhoods. So they, they formed a um, uh, participation from the public, and we went through a year's worth of meetings with the city. To, really? and, and, yeah, and, and to lay out all potential concerns and, you know, pros and cons. And, and so, you know, I went to all of them that were available. Um, and then they, they ruled, they, they actually, you know, uh, signed it into law or, or code within the city that you, you, with the ADUs, you know, that's the direction they're moving, that you, you don't have to have an extension on the driveway. It only has to be five feet separation from the property line. So they made it somewhat friendly uh, for us, and, and we actually capitalized off of that law um, and moved ours in as an ADU. So this is what we get to show people every day. Because we're, we're actually in the in the small home in, in your backyard right now. Exactly. And yeah. it's perfect for when people come over, the five or six people a day that, that come over. So what's what's getting insurance like on one of these? Like having homeowners insurance, is that tricky i mean you said the the market's coming around the industry's coming around like are you able to find insurance fairly easy on these yeah you are and tiny houses are classified as rv insurance so on park models you know the maybe half of them that you call they're going to say we don't work with that but half of them that you call will so you're talking so you can still get a competitive bid on price so are you do you go through more of like automobile insurance then or are you going through home insurance because our rv insurance is through geico and we have an awesome, you know, deductible and awesome payment per month. Like we don't pay that much, and it's full coverage. You know, it's like yeah. having home insurance, and it's pretty, pretty competitive. With with this particular product, you're going to see pretty consistently that there is a, a lot of uh, appreciation by different industries that this is a hybrid, and they don't know what to do with it. Uh, both whether it's regulated by the DMV or whether it's uh, with the state housing authority. The, the insurance company doesn't know, like, do, do yeah. you go through auto insurance Well, companies? you have a few options. As an ADU, it's just an add-on to your homeowner's insurance. Um, it, you can also do RV insurance because technically by title, it is an RV. Um, so we're going to see some other avenues of insurance open up as people start living in them full-time. Um, but there's still a few industries that are a little in the gray on, on what to do it and whether they're going to start carrying it because it's um, typically in the past you weren't allowed to live in an RV full time. And so now these are RVs most of the time sold uh, you know, initially and then they, they might be a full time dwelling for someone, um, especially if you tie it down to the land. And then there's also some, you know, Questions about there's some other uh, manufacturers that are making IRC coated um, dwellings that look like an RV, but those are up to the building standards of cities. So those can go down on lots. So we're seeing a whole transition of the industry right now. Um, this year, I think even 
2017 is going to be a, a big changing point for. And last question for you guys: Where do you see the future of these small homes, tiny homes? Do you think they're here to stay? Do you think this is a, uh, a fad that might last another five, ten years? Being that we're working with two developers here in Austin that will open uh, parks uh, within this year for both 125 units or so, we see this as being a new uh, 150 to $200,000 option to buy a house in, in the near future. Uh, because they're, they're going to be those traditional houses that are going to go to three, four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand in the major cities. And so we think that there's going to be a new category in between the apartments and the condos, and it's going to be owning your small house, very likely leasing the land that it sits on to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, later, maybe transitioning into owning some of the dirt as well. If people were wanting to uh, get a hold of, of you guys, they have any questions, if they're interested in purchasing a small home from you, um, how could they find you? And uh, what would be the best way for them to do that? Our website is buyasmallhouse.com. And it's got all our information. You can write us an email. Okay. On Facebook, buy a small house. Send us a Facebook message. Send us a text with a number on the site. And it'll be link mentioned it'll be linked below. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. And we're open seven days a week uh, from 10 to 4. So um, they're right now private appointments. That way we can help out each client with what they're looking to accomplish. Normally it lasts an hour, um, so it's a great time to really get inside and see the house and then look at digital options for what type of build you might want. Um, we have realtors that we're working with locally that can help you buy land if you want. Uh, and, and then later uh, this summer we'll be taking um, guests out to lots to, to, uh, to be able to choose where you might want to stay. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Mm-hmm.